All right, so what I thought I would do is maybe um, talk for about 15, 20 minutes about some of the technology trends that I'm seeing. Uh, globally and um, maybe talk a little bit about how I think they may be relevant to India and then open it up for questions. So I want to make this fairly interactive. I don't have any slides, um, so I want to just mainly make this conversational. Um, so I'll start off and, and say that you know I, I do believe uh, one of the reasons that I decided to leave Cisco um, is I feel like in the tech industry, and I've been in the tech industry for about 30 years now, um, and in, in the three decades, I feel we're at a very interesting time where there's some profound changes that are occurring. Profound changes meaning it's not just technology-driven changes, but actually business model changes. How, how people buy and, and uh, pay for things and how we consume services, not just physical things, but services is fundamentally changing. So there is a technology-driven change that's going on um, in the industry that's affecting pretty much every vertical, every segment, uh, which is then, as a result of that, changing the business model for many of these industries. Um, so there's technology change, business model change, and the third interesting thing that I'm finding is actually now, because of the pace of innovation, um, innovation is truly happening simultaneously in many parts of the world versus where, uh, when I first joined Motorola, actually we opened an R&D center in India in the uh, late 80s. And at the time, it was all about multinational companies innovating somewhere and bringing products into the emerging markets. And we went from that model to in the 90s and 2000s where companies realized, well, you can't do that. You can't just create a product, strip, strip features out, and take it into a country like India or Brazil or Mexico or China and sell that, that doesn't work. So we actually need to have local teams who develop products there. Uh, so that was sort of like in the 90s. And that worked for a while, except the problem there was still things had to go back to the headquarters, right? So there was a huge communication gap. And actually, Cisco offices right, are right across from the Flipkart offices. You probably know we have a lot of teams uh, here. Um, and they develop products, and then we said, okay, there's a lot of inefficiency when that happens in innovation, where ideas are conceived somewhere, and you have great talent in other places, but the decision-making is slowing down on and how quickly products can be brought to market. So that model is also shifting now, which is the third change, in addition to the technology and business model change, is how innovation is simultaneously getting created uh, across different geographies all at the same time. And a lot of venture capital money is flowing into different geographies at the same time, and you guys are a perfect example of that, right? Where capital is actually shifting, not only really from public markets to private markets, but geographically getting much more distributed. So because of these three things, it's sort of like the three changes all occurring at the same time. I feel the technology industry is profoundly going to be different in the next decade than it has been in the last three decades, and I really want to be at the center of that change. And so that's sort of my motivation for why I chose to uh, pursue doing something different. Cisco is a great company. I still have many, many friends that it will always be dear in my heart. Um, but that was the reason. So then in that context, let's think about what are some of the technology changes that are going on. Uh, obviously, the first change is cloud. You know, things moving from premise-based infrastructure delivering application services to a distributed architecture for compute and associated things that, that are surrounding the compute model um, is enabling man, many of us to consume things in a very different way, right? So cloud computing still is, I feel, I feel it's still very nascent. It's nascent because many of enterprise applications are still today done with premise-based infrastructure or premise-based data centers, and that shift is slowly going to accelerate more and more. Uh, so I think cloud will continue to be a big game changer in terms of the technology. And I feel the same way about mobile. And by the way, I used to come, I mean, I come from the mobile industry. I was at Motorola for a long time. And if you think about, you know, from the time the cell phone was really about a person calling um, a person, right? The cell phone changed when uh, how we called a number, when the number was associated with the place. Many of you are probably too young to know this event. Uh, we used to call phone numbers which were associated with a home or a building or an office. 
Um, and now we just call people cell phones, right? Because when I call your cell phone, I know I'm going to get you. Whereas before, I would call your home number, and who knows who's going to pick up. Um, so that, I think, you know, mobile was all about calling initially. And then, then it went into uh, smartphone and applications and, and messaging. And now text messaging is getting replaced by a lot of the messaging apps, right? I, mean, I, was, I just said I just came back from China, and WeChat is huge in China. To the point, it's actually an enterprise social platform. The company I was visiting in, the whole way the entire executive team communicates is on WeChat. And here it's probably WhatsApp in India. And so these, these, these kind of apps are kind of displacing even text messaging, which is not that old if you think about it. Um, you know, we're still teaching our grandparents how to text, and now kids have already moved on to something different. So mobile is still going to continue to drive a lot of things, and mobile apps, um, you know, I think are going to be big. And in the enterprise especially, it's still very broken, the mobile experience. So that, I think, is going to be one of the last things I did before I left Cisco was drive a partnership between Apple and Cisco to especially solve this enterprise mobility issue because the experience is still very fragmented if we think about it. Um, the third uh, thing, of course, is... Uh, the shift from physical to digital or offline to online. You know, so a lot of services that we used to consume, uh, whether it's calling taxis, moving to on-demand services on the digital platform, whether it's Uber or Lyft or Ola cabs or whatever it is, um, uh, DD in China, you know, I mean, these kind of apps are all about the same thing, getting a ride, but it's now done on a digital platform versus calling a taxi service, which is what we had to do before. Um, and, you know, things that you're doing, e-commerce and buying things and selling things and how we can quickly get, I was watching the screen in the lobby on where your customers are buying things, what products they're buying. I mean, that's such powerful information. Think about it. Before, retailers never had that, right? And I'm on the board of Gap, a large retailer. Um, and it's so difficult for that kind of a model company to be really thinking about how you do business today. Uh, so this is an example of how things are going to shift more and more from offline services to online services. Um, it started off in the travel sector initially. We booked tickets online where instead of going to, again, you probably am dating myself. When I was growing up, we actually had to book train tickets and somebody had to go physically pick up the tickets and bring them home. And we would all travel by train when I was a kid with my parents. We actually had a person that we paid to go pick up our tickets from the train station. And now we do travel on, online, right? And so these, these kinds of things are going to continue to accelerate offline to online ship. Um, so that's the third big trend that I see. And the fourth the big trend that I see is the rise of sensors and the power that data is going to have. So... Uh, if it's whether you call it Internet of Things or Internet of Everything, really more intelligent devices and how these intelligent devices will be more prevalent gathering data and helping us uh, gather information in a more powerful way, you know, where real-time information, real-time data about the conditions that we are in or the things that we are doing, that's going to just start happening. So that's the fourth big uh, shift, technology-driven shift that I see. The fifth is the power of... Um, Analytics. So thus far, what we've done, especially in the IT industry, in the tech industry, is collected data because storage was costs were coming down. It was easy to sh store data, and we just gathered a bunch of data, and we didn't realize what we didn't know what to do with that data, right? And now we have to start investing in. Actually, this is a great opportunity for India. Just like IT services in the big in the 80s or 90s, whenever we started, India started to come become recognized as a software. Uh, economy was through IT services, right, BPO and other things. Similarly, I think we have an opportunity to be providing more of the analytics capabilities because this is after the fact, right, data is collected and we can analyze and, and send things back. I think it's a huge opportunity for India uh, because we already have the computing skills and the software skills and the mathematical skills to be doing that. And by the way, business insights and how businesses is, are using data is so broken right now and very, very early still. So I think the next decade will define that. Um, so I think those are some big technology changes that I see, cloud, mobile, um, uh, sensors or Internet of Things, analytics, uh, offline to online, you know, the shift offline to online. Then if you say in that lens, I talked about business model changes, right? 
So what are the business model changes or how are industries going to change? Um, you know, and I, I kind of think there'll be about, you know, few industries that will probably go through massive change, just like music industry or the content industry did in the first wave of the internet. Uh, it was really the music industry and the book bookshops uh, that have gone away. And I don't know if you read, uh, now Amazon opened actually a bookstore in Seattle, which is interesting. Um, you know, they kind of put away, put big bookstore businesses out of business and now they're doing this. So what does that mean, right? You know, so what's going on there? Uh, but I do feel some verticals will be profoundly uh, change in the next decade. And you know, the few that I am very passionate about, first and foremost, transportation. If you think about cars, and by the way, Bangalore is probably the nightmare example of this. It took me two hours today from get from point A to point B, which is, should have only taken me less than 30 minutes. Then the tra I mean, it's not even traffic. It's just you sit in the car and nothing happens. I don't even call that traffic, you know. Traffic is like LA, where at least you're inching. In Bangalore, you don't even inch. You just sit. And then there's a poor man, a police, trying to figure out which car should go where. It's like this huge algor algorithmic problem he has to solve in his head. And he's trying to direct you, this car, you go here, that car. I was like blown away. I don't think any computer could have even figured out which car should have gone where. But basically, we went nowhere. We just sat. Um, but basically, if you think about how we transport ourselves, um, it's really not changed from the time the internal combustion engine was invented. The car is the car still, right? Fundamentally, nothing has changed other than maybe we have slightly better leather seats and slightly better entertainment systems in automobiles today compared to 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, that I feel, you know, so what we drive will change. You know, I think there'll be more electrification, we'll shift fundamentally from gas mobiles to electric vehicles. I think that will be a profound change. Uh, and I give Tesla and Elon Musk a lot of credit for making that in a reality, but they'll be, the price point of that is still very high. And so they, there is a mass market electric vehicle yet to be made and yet to be deployed. To how we drive that, right? Whether it's full autonomous driving, like what Google is developing, or whether it's some part of it for parking or you know sensing information with ADAS systems um, you know there will be more automation of how the thing gets driven so there'll be more role for computers in cars in the driving part of it not just the car inside the car you know the car electronics have gone more sophisticated but the driving part has not um, to, to uh, ride sharing you know how we will go from point A to point B um, to what what does that mean to mass transportation? All of that, you know, the entire transportation vertical, I think, will change. There's also already interesting companies that are getting started up in Silicon Valley. I mean, everybody reads about autonomous cars or self-driving cars that big companies are working on. But there's a lot of interesting new companies that are gathering data from fleets, like Uber now has a fleet, right? Uh, or in India, Ola Cabs has a fleet of drivers. And so they all carry cell phones. So there's information in that cell phone that you can gather uh, that tells you the behavior of the driver, which you can then sell to insurance companies to do fleet management and automation of fleets. So insurance companies are going to get disrupted as a result of the disruption that we are seeing in transportation. Same thing when a self-driving car becomes a reality a uh, lot of the insurance we take today is for accidents, and 90% of the accidents are human error or more, more percentage. So that rate will drop. So what happens to auto insurers? What happens to body shops? I think so there'll, there'll be a trigger effect, uh, just like the music industry. When that got disrupted, there was a, a ripple effect. Same thing will happen in transportation. So that's the first vertical that I feel very passionately will change dramatically. The second is retail, and it's already underway. Um, you know, I think retail, what has changed so far is basically online. You know, we buy more things online now. But the creation of fashion is still, a lot of it is not online. And that's changing with companies like Rent a Runway and uh, Style Stitch. There's a lot of startups in, in the Bay Area, in the US, that are looking at what people like and can we customize and tailor things and make it more personal. Um, so I think, you know, that's in the fashion industry, but overall, um, even things like, I'm sorry, I keep naming companies that I know in the US, but I'm sure there's similar companies in, in uh, India as well, like what Instacart is doing, delivering groceries, or what Munchery is doing, uh, delivering cooked meals to your home 
in the US. Uh, and my son, who's 22, lives in San Francisco, and he just told me he's using Blue Apron. I don't know if you know about Blue Apron. Blue Apron is a startup in San Francisco that sends you the exact amounts to cook a gourmet meal. And so you don't waste any ingredient, and you don't have to have excess things to stir, and they send you a recipe. So you cook it, you eat it, and you're done. You don't have to like shop for extra things or store extra things. So all of this thing I call retail, right? You know, everything from delivery of goods and to what SHIP is doing in the US, which takes care. And I read today, by the way, in Bangalore, apparently there's a pack, uh, packaged, there's a startup that's addressing first mile. So they come to your home if you have something to ship and they package it and they... Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the whole retail thing, everything from ship, shipping to how things are designed to how they're delivered, I think that whole vertical will look dramatically different. Uh, so it's the second vertical. And fintech, I think, uh, you know, so far we've kind of focused on mobile payments. Uh, but, you know, I think that is just starting. I think there's a lot, especially in India and emerging markets, is a big opportunity in financial um, financial industry and how that will get disrupted beyond digital payments. Um, so that's another interesting area. And, you know, my, my personal passion is learning. Um, you know, I think if you think about learning, uh, I, I don't like to call it education, you know, because if I say education vertical is getting disrupted, people always immediately go to MOOC and online um, education. That's not what I mean. I mean like the concept of learning and training will fundamentally change in the next decade. Um, you know, wh why do I believe that? If you think about, you know, what happens to all of us, and this is true all over the world, you know, we go through rigorous training in high school, right? And we're competing really hard to get into the best college. So we put in all this effort. I know many of you probably care more about your J exam and which IIT you get into or not get into than your own school grades. So there's an intense focus um, in, in the high schools. And then you get into college, and there's an intense focus on that. And then you start working, and what happens? Then you're not learning anymore. You're just expected to learn uh, at work and then figure out how you get ahead. And, uh, same thing, by the way, and, and companies, large global companies spend a lot of money trying to train their employees, but all of that training is very, very loosey-goosey and not at all effective. It's not personalized, it's not targeted, and you as a, a person are not putting in the effort to learn unless you have intense, mo intense motiva self-motivation. Um, so I kind of say this, you know, your phone gets a software upgrade, software upgrade, and increasingly your car will get software upgrade but your brain never gets an upgrade, so to speak, once you graduate from college. So that's a vertical I feel like very passionately that things will change and, you know, so learning as a whole, how we think about learning, what happens and how can this be more of a continuous process, how can it be more personalized so you can perform better at your work. Some of the questions that I was getting asked in the earlier panel, these are all experiential things that I, you know, I, I share because I am here and I'm talking to you. But it shouldn't be that way. It should be a scalable model. It should be something that everybody should have access to, to learn from all of our experiences. So I think learning fundamentally will change. And healthcare will change. Um, and, and I think it'll change because, I mean, we've talked about change in healthcare for a while now, but we've all focused on medical records, digitization, and health IT, and these kinds of things which are very difficult to do. I think increasingly what I'm seeing in Silicon Valley is more people who worked in consumer internet companies have figured out there's a lot of compute capability that we can actually apply to things like screening and genomics and genetic um, uh, screening for things, for diseases, right? So it's, it's actually diagnostic uh, that we can do more of that as a, as a tool and a non-invasive way for us to be healthier. That's where a lot of shift is happening, and I think that will continue to happen. Uh, Mohan and I are personal investors in a company in Silicon Valley called Color Genomics, and that's founded by people who worked at Twitter and Google uh, before. So, you know, I mean, they understand genetics, but they actually understand also compute and data analysis, and that's what they're doing. They're screening for a couple of breast cancer genes um, in women. Uh, so it, it can be a proactive thing that you can discover with a very non-invasive 
tests that you take. And I think there'll be more and more that kind of application of compute in a different way uh, to healthcare and screening. And of course, there's wearables and Fitbits and you know, all of that. So I think healthcare will be another vertical that will get disrupted. Um, and I don't mean health IT, because we've kind of tried, you know, health IT was just like phase one, where we said take all the medical records and digitize it. Um, I think, but fundamentally that really, that was an application versus an innovation, and now we are seeing innovation in the health uh, vertical. So I think those are the things that I feel will happen, and I think these are global trends, and they may be different pace at which that'll, that'll change. The other thing I mentioned was geographic innovation, right? You know, one of the interesting things, and I don't know whether this is a permanent shift, and there's a lot of debate in Silicon Valley uh, off late about market correction and is uh, unicorns, uh, you know, our companies being valued too high, you fall into that category, you're a unicorn yourself. Uh, is that real? Is this valuation justified? Are you guys raising too much money too early at high valuations? What does it mean? Like, there's so many opinions. Um, my own personal view is that there is something that I think the shift, whether the market is going to correct itself or not, who knows, I'm not an economist, but you know, maybe the valuations are higher than they should be, but I also feel like because of all this disruption that's happening, there is a lot of innovation. People are leaving big companies to start new companies because things are changing and people who are leaving schools are actually joining these startups. So because of that, there will be value created in the newer companies. Now, whether that's a billion or several hundred million, I don't know. Um, but I think that shift is permanent. And I think the associated with that capital shifting from public markets to private markets is also somewhat permanent. Um, meaning that uh, you know, the people investing large sums of capital in private companies um, are usually people that would invest in public companies like Cisco and Microsoft, they would buy the stock, right? So some of them may get scared as valuations come down, but some of them will stay. So because of that, there is now more geographic innovation that's happening. You know, so companies are getting created in India and China at the same time they're getting started in Silicon Valley, whereas before there would be a time lag, which is very exciting for me to see. The one thing that hasn't happened yet, which um, I am very passionate about, is for a company to be created simultaneously in two geographies, where you would have a startup that's actually starting different aspects of what needs to be done, some of it in China, some of it in India, some of it in Silicon Valley. That would be very cool. Um, so those are some of my thoughts, and I'll stop there and see if you guys have any questions. I don't know how long I spoke, but if somebody is keeping track of time, I'm assuming. Any questions, comments, agree, disagree with me? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I can hear. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Anchal, and I did my chemical engineering from IT Rurki. So if I am right, you also did your chemical engineering from IT Delhi, so you may be the best person to ask this question. I came just four months back to work with Flipkart in Bangalore, and I want to ask what we as freshers should technically learn to stay competitive in technology. Like, Nobody wants just to exist. Nobody wants to be in job just for the sake of having a job. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think there are two kinds of learning you can have. And you know, one is what can you learn about technology? I think you can learn, I think you especially can, if you just joined the company, you can learn a lot from peers who've been here about technology. But my advice in general, and I do this to this day, is to keep your skills updated. Don't uh, you know, I mean, I started in the semiconductor industry, right? But I never thought of myself as, I'm going to spend my entire life in the semiconductor industry. I never thought of myself as I'm a semiconductor engineer. Uh, I always thought of myself as an engineer. Therefore, I'm going to learn whatever is new, whatever is changing. That's scary sometimes, because I went from semiconductor industry to a, a systems company in Motorola when I became CTO for the whole company I actually had nothing to do with semiconductors. I was, you know, working on building cell phones, and I left that company and came to Cisco, which was very different. Now I'm leaving Cisco to do something completely different. I mean, that's scary when you do that. You go, gosh, I don't know anything about that industry. And for you, you just left school and came to Flipkart, and now you're a chemical engineer. And like, oh my God, you're in the very big e-commerce company. Uh, that's exciting, and you know that is important to have that mindset to say fundamentally I'm an engineer, therefore I'm going to learn about whatever is changing in the field. That takes effort. It takes reading. It takes keeping up with things. It takes talking to people. I spent a lot of time we, earlier. We had a discussion about networking. One part of networking you could do is actually to learn, meet with people, talk to them, 
find out how they've been. One of the reasons I'm here is I want to learn how Flipkart's being. How are new companies being built in India? What kind of culture do they have? How does this office look different from the Motorola office that we started in the 80s in Bangalore? These are all ways you can learn, right? Now, that's how you keep up to date. That's how you stay fresh. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Mayur. Um, I had two parts of my question. First part was that um, while on one hand we're making a lot of progress with respect to information technology, I feel that uh, there's a lot of increasing pressure on natural resources and climate change. Like I look at cities like Bangalore, Delhi and so on, and air pollution, access to clean water or congested roads, etc. And I don't see enough progress happening in technology to solve some of these problems. And I wanted to get your views into why that is the case, because clearly there's a lot of demand, there's a lot of money in it. And the second part of my question is we also get to meet with a lot of uh, government officials and so on. And you know, through your meetings with them, do you see that they are keen to solve these problems along with uh, private industry? And if so, why aren't we seeing much progress in solving some of these problems? Yeah, it's a great question. Actually, I didn't talk about it. I will be, I'm going to a conference in Lisbon in two weeks. Um, and there we are talking about trends for the next half a century, so 50 years. So I thought I would keep it more five to 10 years here. Um, you know, but one of my topics there is food and, and how we'll really address food and the congestion that's happening in cities. Um, you're absolutely right. I think we've, we've, driv we've taken, such, taken natural resources so much for granted. We've actually put a lot of pressure on that. Uh, California, especially where I live in Silicon Valley, is going through a bad drought. We've had drought for four years. Um, and it's very visible if you come to California. Actually, even in my home, all my plants are dying because we're not allowed to water them because there's water restrictions. So it's very personal for me, and I see it. Um, I think there is a lot we need to do. And I think work is beginning to happen now, right? You know, sensors for agriculture, collecting data, making sure water is more used more. Agriculture is actually the worst um, place where water is misused, um, and especially in the United States. We are not efficient in how we do our agriculture. So there's a lot of work that it's beginning to happen now. Um, so I'm optimistic that we will begin to see more sensors and utilization of technology to produce food better. Um, there is also a movement now that is just starting, and it's still very early in the US. There is actually in Chicago, there is a company, I forget the name of it, uh, they do vertical farms just outside of the city of Chicago. So they take a building and they do farming inside, and they do hydrophonic farming. I met the CEO recently. Um, you know, the, the, the issue with that is it's still not cost effective to compete with how you know, normal producers grow. On. But as people start to move, there is also a shift happening towards locally grown produce. Lot, lots, lots of people are now recognizing this. I'm better off eating fewer things that are locally grown that I know are healthy food uh, versus buying something in a supermarket that might have pesticides and other things that might lead to health issues later on in my life. So people are now buying more things at local grocery stores and farmers markets. When that shift happens, I think vertical farming will also intersect that. So I think these are longer term trends. Maybe it may take 50 years to get there, maybe you know, 75 years. But I think things are starting now. Uh, government officials, I don't know, I think it depends. I think uh, I, there are some places where people are progressive. I often find though that people in, and again, I don't want to make any, take any knocks, but usually people in policy setting roles are influential uh, po political roles, always follow the technologists. So I think technologists have to take the lead and push the boundaries and policy regulation, political power will. I've never seen in my entire life where a country minister or prime minister said, yep, we should go discover this, and scientists all rally to discover that. That's probably only happened in the, in the space program in the US, where we said we'll go to the moon, and there was work put into that. But other than that, it's, it wasn't like somebody said, hey, you know what? We need to have broadband connectivity. All you bright people go invent ARPANET. It didn't happen that way. So, I mean, there is funding from government that goes into some of these programs, and I think that'll happen, but it's not a politician who said that or a minister who said that. So I don't pin my hopes on that. I pin my hopes on the scientists and technologists who, who are passionate about it. Any other questions? 
What are you guys worried about at Flipkart? What keeps you up at night? Competition or keeping pace with consumers? Any? You what? Big billion day. What is big billion day? So how do you guys do? So I was in the supply, I'm in the supply chain. Hi, uh, I'm in the supply chain sec uh, department, so I had to visit uh, like warehouses each day and to see that there are no loopholes or anything, any problems. So my part was visiting warehouse, which are like <laughs> 30 to 40 kilometers away from Bangalore each day. And like analysts had to play a different role. They had to like stay awake for 12 to 12 hours, like, uh, and work for 12 12 hours. So each of us were, were working very hard for Big Billion Day. Now, like, everyone is in a relaxed mood. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And she's, you've been here only three months. Yeah, four months. All right. <laughs> four months. Awesome. Great. Any other questions? We have some questions. We have some questions. Uh, which are uh, submitted. OK. We'll take a look at the moderator questions, though. Sure. Uh, you might have covered some of these in your talk already, so we can just. Oh, I'm looking sorry. at I'm like, where am I hearing the voice? We can just go through the questions and figure out which ones. Okay, sure. Okay, while he's doing that. Um, yeah, oh, these are here. You want me to read it out? Oh, or? okay. I sorry, I didn't see the screen. Is it possible to have it all? Does it? Does that exit? Okay, I think this is in the context of women. I'm assuming families and so forth, right? So I don't know. I mean, this, this is a debate about can you have it all? What does it mean? Um, you know, Cheryl wrote a book saying you can have it all, and Anne Marie Slaughter wrote a book saying you can't have it all, and there's a, you know, all these arguments going back and forth. I think for me, it depends on what all is for you. Uh, there is never, there's never an end to what all is, right? Because we all wa always want to have more as human beings. So when you think you have it all, you'll always want something more and you know so I think the the best thing to say what makes you happy and do you are you happy that's how I would look at it so if you say am I happy and do I have all of the things necessary to make me happy yes you can have that absolutely you know for me what makes me happy is my family and my career and my friends and my art and I spend time on all of them not that I divide up each, each of my day into four neat quarters and say, okay, I'm going to spend four hours on this, four hours, it never happens that way. Um, now I haven't seen my son for two weeks because I'm traveling, but that's okay. When I go back, we have Thanksgiving, he's going to come home and we're going to cook together. To me, that's having it all. You know, it's having the things that make you happy. Um, if that's how you define it, yes, you can have it all. But if you define having it all, meaning powerful money, beauty, um, you know, great career, amazing kids, a loving family, amazing in-laws who will always root for you, and, you know, parents who will never criticize you, that's, I don't think that's life. That's not real. That's fiction. Okay. What other question? How did you manage to balance your family? Women have a strong natural tendency. Okay. Um, so it was, I think even for me, it was always family first. I think I was never, I never had a question. So Mohan said, we met in IIT. We met at, uh, in first year of IIT. Um, so we, I don't think we decided to get married right away, but I kind of always knew that I would get married and have a family. So I, there was never a question in my mind that I would only have a career and not have a family. I love having a home, you know, I love decorating my home myself, so I do spend even now, uh, although now I can afford to have designers and decorators, I still decorate my home myself because it's meaningful to me. To me, that is what makes me happy. So actually, if I try to hire a designer or a decorator, I end up firing them after three months because I can never <laughs> like what they do because my home is very personal to me and I have things that I collect from all over the world. Um, so I don't think there is ever there was ever a doubt in my mind as to what came first, but that didn't mean that I would give up 
uh, what I also could have. In other words, I, I never felt to have a great family, I had to give up my career. Um, I, for me, it was always both. I think, in fact, I would probably be a neurotic person if I didn't have my work. I think my work keeps me sane in many ways. Um, you know, it makes me uh, more social, I meet new people. If I just stayed at home, I would go insane. So I think to me, it is not, that's why I don't like the word balance. It's not one versus the other. It's how do you do both? That's the question. And if you set off with saying, I am going to do both, I'm going to figure out how to make it uh, work, then you'll come up with a different answer than if you go off and say, it's this or that. I have to choose. If you set off saying, I have to choose, obviously you're forcing yourself to choose. If you set off, you're saying, I don't have to choose, I'm going to make it work, then you will put different efforts and choose a partner who will support you to do that and figure out how you can make rally the rest of the family to support you. By the way, I'm not being idealistic. It, it's not as if that I didn't, I, I had a lot of criticism, veiled criticism from my family, from my friends about being very competitive, being very... Um, obsessed about wanting to do more and more and more. I still do. People like, why don't you just retire? You're very successful. You're famous. You have money. I, I can. You know, I don't have to work anymore, fortunately. But I am working because I work, in, I work insane hours. You know, I'm, I'm working 12 hours a day because I love doing it. And I think as long as you love doing it, it's not a question of one versus the other. Um, so I think I don't know, I think for all women, for all people, family is always first. I don't think men are any different. I think men want to have children and families and be with their kids and be involved with, with their you know, family life. But I don't think it is a one versus the other thing. Uh, if you could take the first question, the one on first top. Yeah. Do you feel there's a difference in genders when it comes to their approach? Is, is in assertiveness, empathy, technical bet? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, hmm. I can speak for myself, maybe. I can't speak for everyone. That's a very broad question. I do feel I lead differently than my male counterparts um, in the sense that um, I, I do value um, people's opinions in a different way. I have had great peers and great bosses who are, are men. I've actually had a uh, lot of respect for them who are also empathetic, but empathy is in a different way. You know, they may be good listeners, but I think when I listen, I process things differently, and I think that helps me respond to people in a different way. So I don't know if it's a gender difference. I don't know if women in, gen um, in general would lead differently than men. I think it's more of an individual difference. And obviously, the individual difference has in, is some influence based on your gender. I think the way I lead as a person is because I'm a woman, I think about things differently. But I don't, I don't know if that's making sense. I don't think it's an issue of women versus men leading differently. It's me as a person leading differently from the person next to me. And me as a person has some bearing on where I grew up. I think I lead differently because I grew up in India versus some of my counterparts. That has something to do with it. So there's a lot of individuality that goes into how you lead that obviously gender is a factor in that. OK, what is it that inspires you every morning to give your best? My first cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. When I wake up, I'm actually quite a bore. I don't like. I'm not one of those people that gets up, my husband is. Actually, I don't get up and I'm chirpy, and he's made me my first cup of coffee if we are home together for ever since I've known him. Um, so, but I'm kidding. But I think what gives me my inspiration is the, is the motivation to do something important. I feel like every day I want to do, I want to achieve more. I want to do something that's still going. I still feel like there is so much more to do. Uh, and I want to go do that, and that's what motivates me. Which is your most favorite haiku poem and why? Okay, I do like poetry. I don't know if you guys know. I write haikus. I write haikus on Twitter whenever I get time. I think Twitter is perfect for haikus because it forces you to stay within 140 characters. I'm hoping they never change that. Who knows? They may change it now. Um, actually, my first haikus are, haiku is originally a Japanese old form of uh, um, 
ancient poetry form in Japan. And so some of the ancient Japanese poets, uh, I like their um, uh, haikus. I, I can't remember the exact, if I try to quote it, I'll misquote it. But there's a poem about the uh, frog crossing a pond. It's a very ancient Japanese poem. It's a very simple poem. Uh, and basically, it conveys the dilemma the frog has as he's crossing the pond. And it's such a very profound poem in very simple words. So that's my favorite one. Actually, that is what inspired me to start write, writing haikus, because I feel like it is really simple words, describe nature, but has a deeper meaning. So that's my favorite one. Are we done? First question. First question. Yeah. What is the best career advice you ever received? OK. Um, I think the best career, I mean, two, I would say two. One is um, my dad who told me when I went to IIT, I went from South India. I grew up in uh, Vijayawada, which is now Andhra. Since I, when I was here, the state was one, and now it's split. And I went to Delhi. I went to IIT Delhi. And when I left Vijayawada, I thought of myself as a really smart person. You know, I graduated. I think I was number three in the state exam. Um, so I was very confident. I went to Delhi, and I kind of was like, OK, I'm the smartest person on the planet. And I realized in IIT, everybody's super smart. And there were many really smart people. And you know that's intimidating. And then I was in Delhi. I didn't speak very good Hindi back then. And you know, I was far away from my family. And I, you know, I was very sheltered when I was growing up. My dad or mom would drop me everywhere and pick me up. And now I was on my own. So I was really homesick. And um, I called my dad the second week and said, you know what, I want to come back home. Um, because actually, they were not very, my parents were not that keen on me going to Delhi. I think they, they were fine with me going to IIT, but they wanted me to go to IIT Chennai, which was closer to where I was growing up. Back then, there were only five IITs. Now there's a ton more. Um, but anyway, I went to Delhi, and my dad said something, to which to this day I feel is really great advice. He said, um, you've chosen your path. Now it's up to you to make your journey interesting. Um, in other words, you can't come back on the path. You have to figure out how to make the rest of your journey fun and interesting, and that's up to you. Um, you can't come home. And I was so mad at him. Uh, and I was upset. I hung up the phone, and I was crying. I made a big scene. And usually, if your daughter cries, dads give way, right? Dads, I think, if you have kids, um, men are suckers when women cry. Women cry. Um, but that didn't work with my dad. He just said, "No, you have to stay, and you have to finish." And you know, this that to me that was my best advice. That was one of the best advice. The other is actually uh, one of my previous bosses, who's my mentor. Um, he's, he's a much older, retired. He was a previous chairman and CEO for Motorola. When I was debating, I was offered the CTO job for Motorola. And I didn't know whether I should take it or not, because it meant, again, moving from where I was to Chicago. Um, and I called him up, and his name was Fred. I said, Fred, I'm not sure whether I should do this or not. And uh, he said, you know, when, when you find there's an open door, you're never going to go see what's on the other side unless you go through it. You have to go open the door. If you see a cracked door open, you have to go through the door. Otherwise, you'll always be on the side of the door, guessing what's behind that door. Uh, I thought that was great advice. And I did push through the door. And now I give that advice to people. Um, so I would say those are the two. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Padmasri. This was really very inspirational. Uh, I'd like to call upon Dikshita to give you a small flip card memento. Thank you so much for your time. Let's hear a big flip card round of applause for Padmasri. Thank you. Uh, guys, there are snacks outside, so in case you guys are hungry, you can just step out and 